forth. And then we're going to share screen. And we have our, all right. So in the wrap up lecture, when I was looking through this one today, what I really want to do is um, where I think we need to, to kind of finish up. We'll, we'll this one will bleed into Friday because um, there's a lot in the back end of this one that I want to spend some time on and front end, but because um, there's some in this, the back end of this lecture that we really still are having issues with. If all these are issue viruses. But there's one in particular that is Arkansas based and we need to really focus a little more on it. And then I want to wrap up Friday with vaccinations. So kind of give you an idea of what is the, who, what vaccines are like pediatric vaccines. I think there's a schedule for that. And then vaccines for like military, like when they're going some, some places. And then just let you know which ones we have vaccines for and not vaccines for. And sometimes you're, you might, if you talk to somebody that's in the military, you may be shocked at vaccines that they're taking to go to certain places in the world. Or if you're a world traveler, you undergo that same thing, or you have the option to undergo that. So what we really want to look at is like how long before you leave, do you need these vaccines? Uh, so we'll kind of do that. So that's going to be kind of a new part to the lecture. This won't be something that you'll find on the previous year's recording. So if you're looking at the uh, inside the blackboard shell, you're going to see old lectures. You won't see this Friday one. You will see this one um, in the old lecture, but you won't see the vaccinations that we're going to add on Friday. So that's going to be my, uh, is there something wrong with this computer? I, I, let's see. Oops, don't y'all want to see? We'll just do this lab for life. How about that? <laughs> There we go. All right. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. That's the schedule. Any other questions on the schedule, what we're doing? Uh, remember that the final, enduring finals week, uh, again, that will be opened up. It'll just be due on finals day. Uh, all the quizzes will still be open. Your exams won't be open, but all the quizzes will still be open up through, through the studying period for that. Um, so you can go back in and take all six quizzes again and again, and again whatever y'all need to do. Remember, it's comprehensive. So this is the, um, as I like to say, this, this is where you prove to me you still have a handle on something out of unit one. You can still recognize that question and get those answers right through all six units. Again, it will be only 50 questions. I don't expand the number of questions just because the information is big. So it'll be randomized again over the six units that we've had so far. Um, so that's how that works. So, but I will open it up for finals week, but it'll be due on the day we're supposed to take it. So if it's a Tuesday or Wednesday, that's when it'll be due. And I won't, I won't, because we gotta get grades in before graduation. So they always put that right up against us as far as our getting our grades in. Okay, so miscellaneous virus infections, clinically significant but uncommon or lesser known. So some of these you're, you're pretty familiar with. Um, some of them you may not have ever heard of, but I think we've done really well. So our arthropod-borne uh, flaviviruses, which we said we'd revisit this. I think we introduced some of these names earlier. But West Nile virus is definitely here. And, uh, and we're going to show a picture that has Arkansas all by itself with no uh, cases of West Nile virus, but we know that's not the case. Every summer there's West Nile positive somewhere in the state. So um, yellow fever virus and a dingy, dingy virus. So we have those three and some of these are historical, but still, if you go to those regions, they could still be a problem. You still could come down with them. Uh, but a lot of these are historical in those last especially the yellow fever. Let's talk about West Nile. So I'm sitting out um, in the backyard one day and uh, all of a sudden I notice a blue jay drop from a tree. Just drop. You ever seen a blue jay drop from a tree? Like hit the ground. Okay. So 
I go over to the Blue Jay, and the Blue Jay is shortly, a little bit of life left, about 30 seconds later, the Blue Jay is dead. So what does that tell you? Does anybody know? Well, it died quick, but Blue Jays just don't drop. But this is one of the birds that gets infected with West Nile virus. So Blue Jays, because they eat mosquitoes, da -da, right, the, con the connection there, they eat mosquitoes and they do suffer from West Nile. So everybody stand back, right? I'm, I'm a, you know, a disease specialist, stand back. I go get my Ziploc bag and I, you know, go in from one side and grab the bird with the other side, zip it up, put it in the trash that way. Now I could have sent that to the health department. Could have said, hey, I got a bird just died from don't know why causes. We need to check, see if it has positive for West Nile virus. So that's a lot of how that works. When you say there's a positive case in Arkansas West Nile virus, it may be from a dead bird, it may be from a human. So can do, do both. So that's kind of how we follow up on that. But I do want to share that story. Keep, keep you away from blue jays. They start dropping dead out of your trees because they could be infected with West Nile. The West Nile was first isolated. Let me small this one up. There we go. First isolated in the West Nile area of Uganda. So guess what? Region is its name. Before 1999, the virus was endemic to Africa, Israel, and Europe. Since the virus was identified in New York City in 1999, so 22 years ago, right? 22 years ago, it has spread westward across the entire United States into Canada, Central and South America, and the Caribbean. Great, right? So West Nile is closely related to the Japanese and St. Louis encephalitis viruses and is transmitted by the bite of mosquitoes, 59 different species of mosquitoes, in fact. The infection is accompanied by fever, leukopenia, malaise, and may progress to encephalitis causing blindness in only one case. So one out or how many we've had it can lead to some serious info. I mean some sequelae. Birds are the natural reservoir. Okay, so the bird mosquito cycle, which we just described with the blue jay. 300 species are able to be infected, most commonly crows, ravens, and jays. So if you happen to see a crow drop from the line or a raven drop, but for most of us, it's gonna be blue jays because they're all in our backyard. Transmission to humans is through mosquitoes, which feed on the birds and humans. So it is transmissible from a mosquito bite to you. West Nile has been demonstrated in large number of mosquito species, but most significantly, for viral transmission is the Kulax species. West Nile can be transmitted through blood transfusions, tissue transplantation, and even human breast milk. Definitely a, once you got it, can be spread. There's our Kulax hippians feeding on us. We have some really good mosquito pictures today. We'll say that. So how do we know? How do we know? So, you know, with me, um, I came down with something, okay? We don't really know what it was at the time. You know me and these diseases. I always have a disease history. <laughs> so I'm like in, in cells at the time, and I'm just like, you know, I just don't feel good today. I think I'm just going to lay on the couch a little bit. And for a salesman, that's pretty normal kind of activity. You can just kind of bail on your daily schedule and just hang out, go to the pool, go out, go do whatever you want to do as a salesman. And that wasn't a good fit for me. So keep that in mind as you pick your, your careers. Um, but I just got worse. It got where as I'm watching TV, the TV starts to get blurry. You know, that's never good, right? And then when I would go out driving in the afternoon, which should have been an enjoyable time, I had trouble like checking, like moving my head to see cars to the left or to the right. And of course my eyes were all wacky. So I had this neck tension, neck tightness, neck everything, and, and just didn't feel good at all. So, you know, of course I'm like, I can suffer through this. And eventually it just got where I just didn't know it was time to go to the doctor basically. 
And I go to the doctor, you know, we do all the history and the, you know, it, it's summertime. Uh, so it's not like, you know, you got the flu or something. So it's the summer. And they did, it, you know, they did our favorite test. Anybody know what test they did on me? That's my, our favorite test of all, the telltale. What's our number one test here in, in lab that a doctor would do? What's the doctor ordering on me? There you go, right? We think CBC is so simple, so elementary. You know, it's just not going to be, it told a story quickly told the story that I had a viral infection, okay? Don't know which one, don't know which virus I had, but the lymphocytes were, right? And the neutrophils were, right? So the doctor goes, you've got a viral infection. Don't really know which one. We don't really care at this point, right? That's the doctor's story. Um, but you've got a meningitis. You've got a inflamed meninges uh, that we, we, it's a virus. So I don't know if we have anything other than painkillers to treat it with. And that's what he's prescribed. Now, of course, I didn't go fill the painkillers because, you know, why would I need painkillers? I'm not hurting or anything. So um, this, as the, the funny part of the story is when I told my pharmacist sister that I had a Vicodin prescription, she's like, keep that. You need to go fill that right now. Put that in the cabinet just to keep them, just, just in case you need one of those every once in a while. So my sister was trying, you know, encourage me to become a <laughs> an opiate. <laughs> anyway, I didn't ever fill it, but it was that was it. So I don't know which virus. So I said, "Why? How did I get this? Or what? Are, what do you think it? Why do you think virus? Mosquito bites, all right? Mosquito bites is in the summer, and of course you go out any time in the summer in Arkansas. You're going to get a mosquito bite of some kind." So then again, those are the signs and symptoms that you live through, live with, with these kind of viruses. So how do we check what we could have done, right? If they had suspected West Nile virus, we could have done our little IgM uh, with our serum or cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, we have commercial kits. So this was probably 1994-ish, somewhere in there, when I had this. Um, in the summer. So uh, now we may have these kits, IgM, IgG, specific enzyme immunoassays are available. We could do the nucleic acid amplification test, you know, with our PCR uh, used to demonstrate arboviruses and tissues and of fatal cases, right? Uh, you know, because that could have gone bad. That, that, that could have led to high fever. That could have led to some encephalitis. That could have led me to actually perish during that that infection. Um, so you can detect them in, in fatal tissues from humans, right? Post death, bird tissues post death, and detect the virus in mosquito pools. Uh, West Nile surveillance is important and attempts to control the disease. So just be cautious this summer and be kind of listening to the news because you'll you may be watching morning news and all of a sudden they say, hey, the Arkansas Health Department has confirmed the first case of West Nile this summer. That happens. Okay. We're no longer like immune to this in our area. So of course, this is the actual uh, electron microscopy picture here showing you the virus infected in the tissue, probably brain tissue. And this is a brain stem. If you, if you remember your anatomy showing all this, this inflammation, turning it into the flamingo, uh, really irritated brainstem of the encephalitis case. So this was always good because this is like, oh, look at us. We have nothing to worry about, right? No West Nile activity if this picture was taken or this survey was done. As you see, it's just, uh, it's everywhere but here, right? <laughs> Florida, Louisiana, Arkansas, mosquito capitals, right? Yes, it's hard to believe that. All right, so let's jump to 2016. Uh, not too long ago, there's very strong suspicion by the World Health Organization that there was a cluster of microcephaly and Guillain-Barre syndromes. And we see that name and that's, that is that partial paralysis kind of thing. Uh, one, uh, you know, I've talked about our student that had this 
Uh, she had to wear eye patch. She lost, you know, kind of paralyzed her eye. Um, so her vision was goofy. Um, the intestinal problems because one half of her intestines is now paralyzed. So it can, it can be a big, big thing. And we don't talk about it enough because it was just like, oh yeah, if you take the, Z, take the uh, COVID vaccine, you may suffer from healing bar A, even to the point where our OT downstairs, our grad assistant was like, well, I can take care of you if you have that. You know, I know how to take care of patients with healing bar A. In Brazil, associated with, you know, that's the Olympic year, right? 2016 was at the Summer Olympics of Zika. I think it was, wasn't it? Uh, pregnancy, uh, Zika outbreak, now accepted that Zika virus during pregnancy puts the fetus at risk. Now a new study suggests Zika may not be alone in harming babies. It may have some West Nile issues too. West Nile virus and the Powassan virus, both flaviviruses related to Zika are able to cross the placenta and infect the developing fetus. So never good to be pregnant during the summer and be out with mosquitoes. So tell your pregnant friends or relatives that we want to make sure that we don't get mosquito bites during the summer. They can damage the fetus in pregnant mice and replicate efficiently in maternal and fetal tissues of human. West Nile virus and Zika virus transmitted by mosquitoes. From Powassan virus is emerging tick-borne virus. So no, we didn't need any tick issues today, did we? Only in the Northeastern United States though. Both viruses are capable of causing brain inflammation, severe cases of disease, suggesting like, like Zika has a tendency of targeting the nervous system. So we got a microbiologist here um, from the Icon School of Medicine. I, Icon, is that it? Is that how you say that? Icon. Mount Sinai, New York, West Nile, which is the most important pathogen in the United States, can negatively impact developing fetus and very small subset of pregnant women. So this is not one that we just don't want to worry about. This is definitely an issue, especially with pregnant females. Any questions on West Nile? So what we're hoping to wrap up on Friday is like, is there a vaccine for West Nile? Any guesses? Yeah or nay? And would you recommend that for a high risk pregnancy uh, during the summer mosquito season? We're hoping what? We're hoping this cold snap is taking care of our mosquitoes a little bit. Anybody see snow last night? Nobody was up to see the snow? I saw a picture, but I couldn't tell if it was Fayetteville or Jonesboro. They kind of said both at the same time. Anyway, yellow fever virus. One of the great plagues throughout history, thousands of individuals, if you remember your history books, when they were digging the Panama Canal to connect the Atlantic Pacific pathway, um, thousands of individuals died during the 1900s during that construction of the Panama Canal. Walter Reed, here's a name that's familiar to you because it's a hospital up in Washington, DC. An army physician discovered the source of the infection, the vector, the Aedes aegypti, mosquito. First virus clearly associated with mosquito transmission, the first flavivirus effectively prevented by a vaccine. So there is a vaccine for yellow fever. Yay, All right, we do have that info. And if you know your military friends or relatives, then they've had to have yellow fever vaccine before they go out into into certain areas of the world. In the jungle habitat, monkeys serve as the reservoir. In urban outbreaks, humans can serve as the reservoir. So humans become the reservoir of yellow fever. Prevention in urban areas depends on the elimination, what we've seen in parasitology, two is eliminate the vector. Incubation, three to six days following the bite. Primarily affects the liver leading to fever, jaundice, and hemorrhaging. Onset of the, so it's a hemorrhagic virus. Remember that? The onset of the symptoms are sudden, fever, rigors, headache, backache. Rapid disease progression, acute illness, characterized nausea, vomiting, facial edema, dusky pallor, swollen, bleeding gums, uh, hemorrhagic tendencies, cause black vomit, black tarry stools, 
and bruising. Ecchymosis. Tragic picture. When death occurs, when death occurs, mortality rates five to 50%. That's a big range, right? Yeah, we can go, it might be 5% death rate, or maybe 50. Usually six to seven days after you start the symptoms, rarely after 10 days. So this is like, boom. Start running a fever, just like the old movies, not looking good. Probably need to start digging the grave because they're not gonna make it past the week. Yellow jaundice is typically seen in convalescing patients. So that's where it gets its name, yellow fever virus causing jaundice. Diagnosis is often through correlation of symptoms and the patient's location and travel history. I think we've made that abundantly clear. The virus, specific antibodies can be detected, cerebral spinal fluid or the serum, IgG or IgM, right? And we're, we're this is, let's just ask this question. Before the year started, how many of you were up on your IgG, IgM? Has that been something you did like got from this year, like after immunology and now after parasitology, y'all are up on which one's which, right? For me, it kind of started to come into play, like when doctors would order tests. So it really started when I started working. Because do they order specifically IgG or IgM? Well, or do they just kind of throw that at you and make you figure it out? Well, one of them used to be a lab tech, so he like tested me on that. And that's when I realized that I probably need to know the difference. <laughs> I'll just give you the reason I'm asking is just like Kate had said, it's usually just thrown at us. It, it, we, you know, before, well, even after computerized ordering, you know, there were check boxes like, which one do you want? Like, are you looking for IgG or IgM? And if you usually, if the doctor's not a lab tech, it's usually both. You <laughs> just order both. It's like they don't. I never got the idea that anybody ordering tests for me to run knew the difference between IgG and IgM at it. To the point where if you sent it out with Quest or you put it out of your own computerized LIS, you always had to put the detail in there like IgM could indicate acute infection, IgG could indicate acute or post, you know, front, you know post infection for immunity, right? You had to put that in, they put that in the printout for these, but usually it was just like EDAFs and nerves. Which one do they want? They just said order a hepatitis screen. They didn't say they wanted which one, right? So it's up to us to know. We have to know so we can check that box. Um, and you can do both. You can do both together, you can do separate. So when you look at ordering, you can either do the IgG or the IgM or and both at the same time. So you can, you order it that way. Um, NAT testing, you hear it like that. Nucleic acid testing, that's what it stands for. So you see a lot of that with blood donations. And I think Dr. Walsh should have gone over NAT with you a little bit, right? In immunoheme. Yeah, NAT, NAT testing. Nucleic acid testing, that's how they test the blood for a lot of stuff after it's been donated. No? Okay. That's what they use. Uh, histopath cell culture can be used for tissues of, again, fatal cases. We don't do tissue until post mortem. Oops, can't forget this because this is a little history. This hits home with yellow fever because you're like, oh, oh, that's down in Panama Canal. Don't have to worry about it. We've had some outbreaks of yellow fever, historical outbreaks, one in Shreveport, Louisiana. If you don't know that, that's in the northwest corner of Louisiana, which would be just south of the southwest corner of Arkansas. Almost a quarter of its population died in 1973 to yellow fever. In 19, I mean, 1878, 20,000 people died in, in the Mississippi River Valley near Memphis, right, because of flooding. Uh, increase in the mosquito population resulted in a huge <laughs> epidemic of yellow fever. Uh, even so much that steamship John Porter took people fleeing Memphis northward in hopes of escaping the disease. 
passengers were not allowed to disembark once they went north due to concerns of what? The human became a vector. So the human spread was definitely an issue. The ship roamed the Mississippi River for the next two months, can you imagine, uh, before unloading it, her passengers? Well, you can't imagine, because we're fixing to bring, this was the late, last major U.S. outbreak, was in 1905 in New Orleans. So definitely hitting all around us. But back to the question, can you imagine being on a ship and not being allowed to disembark because of an infection? IEC COVID a year ago, right? The cruise ships, they couldn't come off, they couldn't disembark. But everybody's ready to go jump back on those. But this is not new, all right? Now you know that in, in 1878, it started. We wouldn't allow yellow fever uh, passengers to get off. Made them stay on the Mississippi River. So look at this, I love this picture of this mosquito. This is yellow fever mosquito. Of course, we don't, I don't think I've ever seen one around here. The dengue virus. Dengue is most prevalent arbovirus in the world. 100 million people are infected annually. It's endemic to Latin America, Asia, Africa, 90% of the cases in the United States are travel related. So going to these areas, you come back with the dengue virus. Dengue is a leading cause of illness and death in the tropics and subtropics. Humans, again, are the main reservoir through a mosquito vector. Primarily transmitted by the 80s mosquito, the 80s Egypti. And this gives you the world map as you see, this is important because this is southeast. It's non-epidemic -epi here, but it is cases in the southeast part of the United States. So this is one that is usually Florida has an outbreak. Uh, you'll see that every once in a while. But if it's here, right, and humans are the reservoir and mosquitoes are the vector, <laughs> it wouldn't take long start spreading more than just travel based. Or if you want to say, hey, when I go to Florida, that might be where I pick it up. You don't have to travel that far to come in contact with it. A vector control, again, the mosquitoes. I don't know what the answer is. Um, if we could sterilize the mosquitoes somehow, I know that's one way people are trying to control mosquitoes. The dengue virus normally affects adults or older children. It's seen in a variety of clinical manifestations, non-lethal fever, arthritis, and rash. Can lead to severe hemorrhagic fever or dengue shock syndrome. 25,000 people die annually of this. Sudden onset of fever, headache, chills, a macropapular rash visible on the trunk, spreads to the face, the extremities, no vaccine available for the dengue virus. Diagnose IgM, IgG antibodies or RT-PCR, real-time PCR, reverse transcriptase PCR, whichever way you wanna go with the RT there. So it shows the, the, uh, the rash, classic, well, what do we got up there? Oops. What's that word? You'll have it on your slide. Classic or white in the sea of red. Islands. islands. Classic islands of sea of white in the sea of red. Macropapular. All right. So we're getting to about where we're going to finish one more, and that's going to be it for today. We're going to save the uh, human papilloma for Friday, right? Friday morning. Uh, so we'll do one more. Uh, the metanumovirus. And what I want to talk about here is it's very similar to RSV. So paramyxoviridae, the metanumovirus. So uh, I don't know if we're going to call that the MSV, right? like respiratory syncytial virus, we'll call this one the metanumovirus. Newly discovered virus 
considered to be the second or third most common cause of hospitalization of lower airway disease in pediatric patients. So definitely, and this is, you know, when I gave you the history of RSV was if we had an RSV positive pediatric patient, they got a night to children's hospital. That was just, that was just common. That was just like, hey, we got an RSV positive. They're going to children's. We'll ask for children's to come transport your baby to their NICU and spend the night there to make sure they don't have any respiratory issues. Uh, the virus causes uh, bronchiolitis and pneumonia in infants, probably lower respiratory disease in older adults. Like a respiratory syncytial virus, the metanumavirus disease is associated with winter epidemics that vary in severity from year to year. So that's usually when here comes the, the baby in arms that's got the snotty nose and doesn't know, what, you know. And parents will usually present that patient to the ER in, I think they stopped breathing. I wasn't sure they were still breathing. They looked to be struggling breathing and that's usually when they come in. So, um, and that is the fear is that they stop breathing due to all of this cruddy, runny stuff they get up in their nose and throat. So we do a nucleic acid test, NAP testing again for viral RNA. It's becoming more widely available for diagnosis. Cell culture is very difficult, takes over two weeks. So we don't use that as far as quick. Now we do have quick RSV testing, which we did in immunology last semester, which is just swab the nose like you would for flu, rinse off the swab, put the antigen onto the test strip where the antibodies are located for fluorescent, you know, not fluorescent, but color change, color uh, chromatography, color changing, right? Colometric. Remember what that was? You remember that in the test? What did we call it? You know, the cards were not fluorescent, but it changed color. Do you remember that word? What was yeah, chromatography. chromatography. Yeah, it sounds. But it's a color change. It had colometric. It's colometry. That's what it was. Yeah. Is that the right word? Okay, I'll go with that. All right, y'all have any questions? So we'll save the human DNA viruses for Friday. Um, just to get your weekend off a good start. All right, we're going to end it there. Sorry about the delay in the Zoom invitation. We'll stop the share. And uh, again, this is recorded, so I uh, will get posted on YouTube. You guys, uh, I guess y'all be in lab tomorrow, but not Parasit Labs.